Good afternoon. Welcome to another City Club Friday Forum. I'm Doug Marker, President of the City Club. And our program today is Climate Change and its Implications for Oregon with Dr. Jane Lubchenco. First, a few announcements and a reminder, please, to turn off your cell phones and paging devices during today's program. And I see a couple people reaching, so I appreciate that. A uh, few announcements. Our Friday Forum next week, April 28th, is the American presidency a glorious burden? And our panel will be Robert Isinger, chair of the political science department at Lewis and Clark College, William G. Robbins, emeritus distinguished professor of history at Oregon State University, David Saracen, associate editor at the Oregonian, and the panel will be moderated by Christy George, the host of OPB's Oregon Territory. Following today's Earth Day theme, our new Leaders Council is offering two excursions into the community. The first is a tour of the Far West Fibers Hillsboro Recycling Facility at 10 o'clock tomorrow morning. Jeff Murray of Far West Fibers will lead the tour, and Judy Crockett of the Portland Office of Sustainable Development will discuss local and regional recycling policies. You can get driving directions from Tim Krauss uh, at the City Club office or at the, at the registration table after the program. Then next Wednesday at 5.30, there'll be a tour of green building practices at the Gene Vollum Natural Capital Center in the Pearl District. The tour will be led by Sydney Mead, program manager at Ecotrust. And the tour size is limited, so please call the City Club office to register. Our Citizens Read book group is reading field notes from a catastrophe, and will gather at City Club Commons this coming Monday evening at 7 p.m. The moderator for the discussion will be Tim LaSalle, director of the Northwest Earth Institute. I'd like to welcome two new members to the City Club who are joining us today, and I'd ask them to stand when I say their name. Jennifer Allen and Roger Devine. Welcome to City Club. And we're continuing our spring membership campaign, and we continue to offer a special incentive for you current members to recruit new members. When no, whenever a new member joins and lists you as a referral, you'll both receive a voucher for a free Friday Forum lunch, courtesy of a generous donation from City Club member Ned Hayes. For more detail about this incentive, please contact Margaret Eichmann at the City Club office. Our sponsors this quarter, who make broadcast of City Club possible, our CH2M Hill, Schwabi Williamson and Wyatt, and West Coast Bank. Would you join me in thanking our sponsors? <laughs> to our program, tomorrow is Earth Day, which began in 1970, when Wisconsin Senator Gaylord Nelson began the first nationwide day of awareness about the condition of the environment. That first Earth Day was only a year after Life magazine featured on its cover a picture of Earth taken from outer space. Many people still remember that stunning view of the Earth as a fragile ball spinning in space, as their awakening of concern for the health of the Earth's environment. 36 Earth days later, science warns us that the impacts that humans are causing on our spinning ball in space are only accelerating. Our speaker today is a national leader in the science of the Earth's health and ecosystems. Jane Lubchenco is the Valley Professor of Marine Biology and Distinguished Professor of Zoology at Oregon State University. Her work focuses on ocean ecosystems, climate change, and the connections between the environment and human well-being. Jane has taken the results of her work on the Oregon coast to teach about climate change nationally and internationally. For her work, she was named a MacArthur Fellow called the Genius Grant. She has an impressive record of leadership in the scientific community. She is a past president of the American Association for the Advancement of Science and the International Council for Science. She is a former member of the Executive Committee of the National Academy of Sciences, and she served for 10 years on the National Science Board. Please welcome Dr. Jane Lubchenco.
Good day, everyone. It's indeed a very great pleasure to be here with you, and I want to take this opportunity to thank the City Club for the invitation. In listening to the Friday Forum Lecture Series on OPB over the years, I've been struck by how varied, interesting, substantive, and relevant the various programs are. It seems to me that the City Club has much in common with the ancient agora of Athens as the intellectual heart of the city, a central place for political and intellectual dialogue and wrestling with the important issues of the day. So it is indeed a very great honor for me to participate in this City Club Friday Forum. Recent Friday Fora have been focused primarily on candidates and on elections, lots of them. I hope you're ready for a bit of a break because I'm not running for anything. <laughs> As you know, I'm an environmental scientist and a marine biologist, and I'm here today to talk about the science of climate change. I firmly believe that the role of science in this regard is to inform our understanding, to inform our decisions. The science should not dictate what we do. For each of us, as individuals, and institutions as well, take into account many different factors in making a decision. Values, economics, politics, etc. But those decisions will be better decisions if they are informed by the best possible information. So it is in this spirit of informing our understanding of climate change that I offer my thoughts to you today. It seems like just yesterday that I last spoke at the City Club, and yet much has happened in the intervening eight years. My topic then was the science of climate change and other environmental issues. And many of your questions focused on struggling to understand how the climate system works, how do we know it's really changing, and how do we make sense of the apparent controversies in the scientific community? Eight years ago, most of the American public was quite confused about global warming and didn't take it very seriously. Today, the dialogue is very, very different. A recent survey commissioned by the Ad Council and its partners and conducted by the Republican pollster Whit Ayers found that 71% of Americans believe that global warming is happening, 71%. Moreover, 53% primarily attribute the changing climate to human activity rather than natural cycles. And now, all of a sudden, news of climate change is everywhere you look. Recent coverage on TV, for example, there was a whole series on public broadcasting, Na National Geographic and C Studios were the co-sponsors called Strange Days on Planet Earth. Earlier this week, NOVA had a special program on climate change. And tomorrow, HBO, entitled Too Hot Not to Handle in celebration of Earth Day. News and entertainment magazines are also full of actually quite substantial and substantive coverage of climate change. Cover stories or major features have recently appeared in Time, Newsweek, The Economist, Business Week, The New Yorker, and Vanity Fair. And Elizabeth Colbert, who is the author of The New Yorker series, has just turned her series into a book, which I see is on display at the table in the back of the room. Not to be outdone, daily papers from the Oregonian to the Daily Historian to the Seattle Post-Intelligencer are printing front page extensive coverage as multiple part features on global warming. In addition to all of this, the Ad Council, in partnership with Environmental Defense and the Robertson Foundation has just launched a three-year major public awareness campaign 
called Flight, Fight Global Warming. The Ad Council is a private, nonprofit organization with a rich history of marshalling volunteer talent from the advertising and media worlds to, discover, to deliver critical public service messages to the American public. The Ad Council says that it aspires to create positive change by raising awareness and inspiring action. And that indeed is what these ads uh, are designed to do. You will undoubtedly recall many of the Ad Council's former iconic public service ads that include Smokey the Bears, Only You Can Prevent Forest Fires, or the Crash Test Dummies campaign for seatbelt use, or Friends Don't Let Friends Drive Drunk, or A Mind is a Terrible Thing to Waste. The fact that the Ad Council has now taken on the challenge of global warming is indeed a sign that the issue is being taken seriously, very seriously, at least by some. This change in attitude and news coverage poses two questions. Number one, why is all this coverage happening now? And number two, if most Americans believe that climate change is happening and is due at least in part to human activity, why is something like a new Ad Council campaign needed? I believe that the answer to the why now question lies in the overwhelming amount of new and very powerful scientific findings that emerged in 2005, validated by many Americans' personal experiences. 2005 was really a tipping point for the science of climate change. During that year, and now continuing into 2006, scientific discoveries and new measurements prove conclusively that the climate is changing and that it's doing so even more rapidly than predicted. During 2005 and 2006, scientific studies confirmed that human-induced climate change is leading to rising atmospheric and ocean temperatures, sea level rise, increases in the intensity of hurricanes, changes in ocean circulation, rapidly melting snow and ice, changes in vegetation, in species distributions and ranges, and in the availability of water with more droughts and more floods. It's also increasing the acid content of oceans. And in almost every single one of these cases, the changes that have now been documented were either greater or happening at a faster rate than scientists had predicted. Let me flesh out a few of these findings for you, all taken from the peer-reviewed scientific literature from 2005 and 6. I'll cite 10 new and sobering findings and remind you that this is just a selection. 2005 was the hottest year on record. The former record was held by 1998. The record warmth in 2005 is particularly notable because global temperature did not receive a boost from a tropical El Nino this year. The prior record year, 1998, on the contrary, was lifted from the increasing trajectory that had been underway by the strong El Nino on record. Following 2005 and 1998, the next hottest years are 2002, 2003, and 2004. Do we detect a trend here? This recent warming coincides with rapid growth of human-made greenhouse gases. Basically, the Earth is absorbing more heat, more energy than it emits. Number two, higher global temperatures are causing melting of polar ice sheets. Greenland's ice sheet, for example, diminished in 2005 at a rate more than twice what had been seen a few years ago. The thinning and melting of ice sheets is accelerating at both poles 
and glaciers around the world. Arctic sea ice has been retreating significantly over recent years. The melting season in 2005 was at an all-time low, 6% below the average. The ice is melting more rapidly than was predicted. This in turn leads to changes in ocean salinity and that in turn affects ocean circulation. Number three, in the Antarctic, 87% of the 244 Antarctic glaciers have retreated. These studies confirm the model predictions that the poles will warm faster than lower latitudes. However, the rates of change are much faster than predicted. Number four, new analyses of ice cores now tell us that at no time in at least the past 10 million years has the atmospheric concentration of carbon dioxide exceeded the present value of 380 parts per million. The Earth is now in what scientists call a no analog state, meaning that there is no historical precedent for the current levels of CO2, at least back to 10 million years ago when the world was a very, very different place. The oceans are heating up, number five, and doing so faster than predicted. Natural phenomena such as solar or volcanic influences are insufficient to explain the increases in ocean temperatures that have now been recorded. Number six, corals are bleaching and dying at greater rates than ever before around the world, due in part to warmer waters. Number seven, 2005 shattered all tropical storm and hurricane records. There were 26 tropical storms. The previous record was 21 in 1933. And for the first time, the alphabetical list of names wasn't long enough. And so after Hurricane Wilma, the last uh, in the names selected for the year, storms were named after Greek letters. Fourteen of those storms became hurricanes, and the previous record, set in 1969, was 12. While scientists have yet to conclude that the number of hurricanes per year is correlated with climate change, two studies document conclusively that the increase in the intensity of hurricanes is attributed, at least in part, to climate change. There is a clear and strong correlation between the intensity of a storm and the temperature of the ocean water. Warmer water means stronger storms. Number eight, circulation in the oceans is changing. With the Atlantic conveyor belt that distributes heat around the planet, slowing by 30% compared to the time between 1957 and 2004. Number nine, climate change is altering the water cycle, the hydrological cycles of the planet. Around the world, there are increases in the frequency and intensity of droughts and more flooding. These changes have immediate consequences as well as longer term implications for global food supply and many ecosystems. And number 10, the oceans are becoming more acidic as the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere is being absorbed by the oceans, increasing its acid content. This bodes ill for all plants and animals in the sea that form a shell or a skeleton. From microscopic plants, the phytoplankton that have shells, to oysters and clams, to sea stars, and sea urchins and corals. There's a lot more that happened in 2005, but these 10 suffice to emphasize a few key points. One, that climate change is happening. It's very real. Two, that the changes are happening faster than predicted. 
And three, these changes are affecting people's lives, often in very dramatic fashion, from unprecedented floods and droughts and storms to fights over water. It's worth noting that a very thorough search of the peer-reviewed scientific literature from 2005 and 6 reveals that there is not a single peer-reviewed scientific paper in those years that contradicts the findings that I've just described to you. A critically important point is that even if we were to stop all greenhouse gas emissions today, the world would continue to warm sea levels would continue to rise, and the ocean would continue to become more acid, all due to the inertia in the climate system, primarily the, the inertia in oceans. There was a lot of work done in 2005 focused on this inertia and what it bodes. Experts who have reviewed the above information conclude that this is overwhelming evidence that, that this overwhelming evidence, the scale at which the changes are happening, and the inertia in the climate system, all lend urgency to the need to do two things. One, to prevent even greater disruption, and two, to prepare for the inevitable changes that are underway because of emissions that are already in the atmosphere. Experts say that it's time now to move seriously from climate change to climate action. However, social scientists tell us that action does not follow immediately on general knowledge. For example, just knowing that the Earth is warming does not necessarily cause any individual to go do something about it. Action requires conviction that the changes are imminent and will affect an individual personally and that the individual can do something meaningful. So therefore, it's important for us to think about how these global changes affect us here in the Pacific Northwest. When Governor Kulingowski established a governor's advisory group on global warming a few years ago that I had the pleasure of co-chairing along with Mark Dodson. We invited scientists to help the governor's advisory group understand the changes underway in the Pacific Northwest and to give us some guidance. Scientists from around the region compiled all of their information into a scientific consensus statement that was issued in 2004. And this effort was led by Gail Achterman, by Mark Abbott, and Sherm Bloomer, all either deans or directors of institutions at Oregon State University, but involving scientists from all around the Pacific Northwest. This scientific consensus statement on likely impacts highlighted both the changes that have happened in the last couple of decades and also what changes are likely to happen in the future. The scientists agreed that, like the planet, the Pacific Northwest is indeed warming. The warming is not uniform every single place, but the overall trend is indeed toward warmer and warmer. It also says that since the beginning of the 20th century, average annual precipitation has increased by 10%. And it notes that land on the central and Oregon coast is being submerged by rising sea level at an average rate of 0.06 to 0.08 inches annually. Critically important are two additional findings. One, that between 1950 and 2000, snowpack declined dramatically. And between 1950 and 2000, stream flow was happening earlier and earlier. Peak stream flow was earlier. What did this group conclude about what's likely in the Pacific Northwest in the coming decades? Over the next 10 to 50 years, 
the following predictions are made. Number one, temperatures will continue to warm, and it's highly likely that by 2030, they will have warmed 2.7 degrees Fahrenheit, more than now, and by 2050, 5.4 degrees higher than now. That's a lot of warming. This is assuming a business as usual scenario that we, cr that we continue on our current trajectory of uh, emissions. The second prediction uh, had to do with precipitation. And the following uh, was noted. There are so many complex things affecting levels of precipitation in the Pacific Northwest that we don't fully understand that it's not possible to make any accurate predictions about either increases or decreases. So we don't know what's down the road with respect to precipitation. With respect to sea level, number three, it is expected to continue to rise at about the same rate. Number four, snowpack will continue to decline as it has been. Five, stream flows will continue to peak earlier and earlier as warmer temperatures melt the snow that has accumulated during the wintertime. And five, marine ecosystems are expected to change, but exactly in what way is uncertain. The uh, upwelling of cold water from the deep ocean that brings nutrients to the surface and fuels our very rich and productive ecosystems off our coast. That upwelling is driven by winds, and the winds are determined by, in part, differences between the temperatures on land and in the oceans. And so it stands to reason that the frequency or intensity of upwellings is likely to change, but we don't understand enough about the drivers of those to make accurate predictions. We have already seen uh, the first ever dead zone, zone of hypoxia or low oxygen water, off the coast of Oregon from about Newport to Florence, the central Oregon coast. The first ever dead zone reported in 2002 with um, also dead zones in 2003 and 2005. It's, uh, the, the, those dead zones are a result in part of changes in ocean circulation and atmospheric patterns uh, that are consistent with what m one might expect under a warming planet. Uh, but we cannot say that definitively. Many of you will recall that last summer we had some very bizarre things happen as well off our coast with a full two-month delay in the onset of this upwelling and a collapse in the marine ecosystems due to lack of any nutrients uh, and therefore very few plants and very few small fishes to feed larger fishes to feed seabirds, marine mammals, uh, and fishes that we like to catch and eat. With respect to terrestrial ecosystems, the scientific consensus statement predicts increased droughts, increased vulnerability of forests to insects, disease, and fires. After that report was published, there have been increased reports suggesting additional changes. Recently, Michael Milstein in the Oregonian reported information from researchers at PSU that I'm sure many of you saw, indicating that seven glaciers, the seven largest of the 11 glaciers on Mount Hood have shrunk by 37% since the beginning of the last century. All in all, then, we have strong evidence that the climate is changing, both globally and locally. And these changes are likely to bring many real problems from droughts and floods to extreme weather events, to changes in fisheries and forestry and agriculture and recreation and coastal ecosystems and likely more.
So what's being done if we're talking about segueing from climate science to climate action? Social scientists, as I remarked earlier, have focused on the importance of people believing not only that it's happening, but that it's affecting them and that they can do something about it. There is encouraging news on the climate action front. Many U.S. communities and states and businesses and individuals are indeed taking action. The Northeastern states are designing and implementing a carbon cap of utilities in the region. The governors of Washington, Oregon, and California are collaborating on a few joint actions to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. And now Oregon and Washington, along with New England states, have adopted California's tailpipe emission standards. Many, many businesses are beginning to take note. Initially, the insurance agencies, because they were the ones that were footing the bill for many of the disasters that were happening. But more and more businesses are seeing that it's in their own interest as businesses to get ahead of the curve, to begin to figure out how to reduce emissions, and are discovering, in fact, that there is money to be made in doing so, and other savings. The World Resources Institute, Environmental Defense, and the Pew Center for Global Climate Change each have uh, groups of businesses that are working together to help devise strategies to reduce their own greenhouse gas emissions and to save money in the process. General Electric, for example, Johnson & Johnson, and Citigroup and FedEx are a few of the companies that have adopted new policies designed to reduce emissions. Our very own Norm Thompson is highlighted in tomorrow's HBO special, Too Hot Not to Handle, for its actions to reduce emissions. General Electric recently committed to double its annual investment in clean energy research and development to $1.5 billion, and it looks to double revenue from energy efficient products by 2010. Clearly, this largest publicly traded company in the U.S. says that it's increasingly green to be green. GE's greenhouse gas emissions that were on a trajectory to rise 40 percent by 2012 are now targeted for a 1 percent decrease. Change is possible, and it's proving powerful and good business. Closer to home, Portland was the first local government in the U.S. to adopt a plan to address global warming in 1993. In 2001, Multnomah County joined the city of Portland in adopting a revised plan outlining more than 100 short and long-term actions to reduce emissions 10% from 1990 levels by 2010. The city and the county have made remarkable and substantial progress in carrying out these actions, and local emissions are indeed dropping sharply and in striking contrast to the national trend. Despite rapid population and economic growth, local greenhouse gas emissions in 2004 in the city and the county were only slightly above 1990 levels, the benchmark year <clears throat> that was established by the Kyoto Protocol. On a per capita basis, emissions have fallen by an impressive 12.5%, an achievement unequaled in any other major U.S. city. We have a lot to be proud of. These successes are due to a wide variety of complementary approaches, many of which bring other health, economic, and social benefits. Some of the successes include the addition of two major light rail lines and the Portland streetcar, and a 75% growth in public transit use since 1990. The City of Portland's purchase of renewable energy for more than 10% of its electricity use, a recycling rate of 54% among the highest in the nation. 
the construction of nearly 40 high-performance green buildings, and the planting of over 750,000 trees and shrubs since 1996, improving the quality of local waterways as well as absorbing carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. The successes continue with the weatherization of 10,000 multifamily units and over 800 homes in two years, and the establishment of the Energy Trust of Oregon and consistent funding for energy efficiency and renewable energy programs. These are indeed heartening and encouraging steps, and they demonstrate that serious commitment coupled with ingenuity and the right policies can be effective. The Governor's Advisory Group on Global Warming took stock of the statewide actions that are needed to make comparable and even greater progress, and they issued a package of recommendations. They set some goals. The current trajectory of greenhouse gas emissions in the state is on a pretty steep upward slope. The Governor's Advisory Group suggested the following goals, that by 2010, we would quit going up, we would arrest the growth of emissions. By 2020, we would achieve a 10% reduction. And by 2050, achieve climate stabilization, which would be at least 75% below 1990 levels. How might this be done? The report details a whole package of different um, steps that can be taken and highlights work that's needed to flesh out some for which we had insufficient preliminary information. These steps include investing in energy, land use, and materials efficiently, replacing greenhouse gas, ener greenhouse gas emitting energy sources with cleaner technologies, increasing biological sequestration, both farm and forest carbon capture storage, and promoting and supporting education, research, and technology development. I'm pleased to say that the governor has embraced these recommendations and is acting on them, for example, by adopting California's tailpipe emission standards. The scientific messages of 2005 and 6, however, underscore the urgency of moving much more aggressively on these fronts. In particular, moving much more aggressively in reducing emissions, but equally importantly, preparing for the changes that will happen even if we significantly reduce emissions. For those things to happen, greater public awareness is needed. More forceful engagement of the private sector, and most of all, national leadership. The Ad Council, Environmental Defense, and the Robertson Foundation, as I mentioned before, have launched the Fight Global Warming campaign. And there is a plethora of information at their website, fightglobalwarming.com, that gives all sorts of useful tips for individuals to convince them of the things that they can do. For example, there's a brochure that you can download from the website that helps you understand how to count your carbs, how to count your carbon units, and to go on a low carbon diet. They are launching some very powerful TV and radio and print ads. You can also view them on the website. The main messages from that campaign are that the problem is urgent, much more so than people have believed in the past, and two, that individuals can in fact do something and make a difference. Recycling, washing clothes in warm and cold water instead of hot, turning water heaters down to 120, not overheating or overcooling rooms, buying compact fluorescent bulbs, insulating walls and ceilings, using a fuel-efficient car, 
or even better, public transportation, or even better, walking, replacing old appliances with efficient new ones, only running the dishwasher when full, caulking and weather stripping around doors, and more. Now most people think, is that really going to make a difference? Well, you'd be surprised. Individual actions can really add up. For example, if every household in the United States changed just three light bulbs to compact fluorescence, this would be the equivalent of taking 3.5 million cars off the road. That's a lot. And it doesn't take much to change those three light bulbs. If all Americans insulated their homes, that would save 200 million tons of carbon per year. If everyone bought a car with just 5% better gas mileage, the savings would be 500 million tons of carbon per year. So this new campaign is indeed timely. It builds on the emerging information from the scientific community, and it encourages individuals to take this seriously and to do their part. Individual actions need to be encouraged and enabled, though, by state and federal policies. Our own Department of Energy in Oregon has long championed energy conservation and renewables. In Oregon, we have a leg up. We are doing many of the things that need to be done to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. But it's nowhere near the scale that it needs to be in light of the new findings that I have shared with you. What's needed? Much greater public awareness. Not just those of you in this room, but every Oregonian, every American needs to be aware of the problem and acting. What's needed? Stronger state, regional, and especially national policies to harness American ingenuity and to enable market-based approaches. Social scientists have pointed out that this country has a long and distinguished history of going along and ignoring a problem for a long period of time and then reaching a tipping point and bam, social attitudes change very, very dramatically. Such thresholds have been reached in public attitudes toward drunk driving, toward smoking, toward civil rights, and going back farther in time, women's suffrage. The knowledge that there are tipping points in our social systems gives us hope that despite the magnitude of the problems, we can actually effect meaningful change. In conclusion, 2005 was a tipping point in the science of climate change. New measurements have given us conclusive evidence that the climate is changing, that human activities are driving much of the change, and that the changes are happening much faster than anticipated. This information now lends urgency to the need to reduce emissions and to adapt to changes that are inevitable. The dialogue is indeed shifting from climate change to climate action. Thank you. We'll now open the floor for questions. Questions are a privilege for City Club members only and appreciate it if you could keep your questions to 30 seconds or less. Our first question will come from our board host, Carla Kelly. Carla is general counsel for the Port of Portland, and she chairs the City Club's program committee. Carla? Thank you, and I want to thank you, Dr. Lipchenko, for being willing to talk with us today as we begin our Earth Week activities and for speaking so eloquently about this issue. You, uh, my understanding is that you work extensively, um, not only in Oregon, but all over the world. And in many countries, the political response to global warming has been very different from the American response, 
where it's been largely a very partisan issue. Uh, which country do you think has taken the most rational approach to global warming, and what would you have us do that they do well? Thank you, Carla. It's hard to point to a single country, uh, but I can tell you that in traveling all around the world, um, it really has been in many times an embarrassment to be an American uh, because our national policies are so ignorant of the realities. Um, many other countries are, in fact, uh, have approved the Kyoto Protocol, not that that is the only um, way to address climate change, but it signals the belief that it's an important problem and the intent to do something concrete about it. Uh, most other major countries, including the emerging ones uh, that will be big emitters of carbon in the future, uh, China and India, are taking this issue very, very seriously and are adopting policies. I believe that there are huge opportunities for American businesses to develop and export, as well as use locally, new technologies that will enable them and us to significantly reduce and adapt. Dr. Lubchenco, Steve Schell, member. Uh, I was alarmed by the uh, NOVA uh, presentation this week. Um, I, I, um, I'm concerned that contrails and pollution are interfering with sunlight, and that maybe has been checked a little bit by the global warming activity, but there was information presented there that indicated that there is a change underway in, in that possibility, and that there's a very short window, uh, if that change occurs, when those two phenomena, rather than offsetting each other, global warming and, and uh, sun dimming, rather than offsetting each other, could combine and cause a significant increase in the ocean levels, for instance, up to 25 meters or 75 feet, and within a very short time, cause a release of methane gases in the, in the, uh, from the bottom of the ocean. Could you comment on what you think of these theories and also uh, what you think of uh, uh, Dr. Hansen of NASA's prediction that we only have a very short window to address these? Thank you for those questions. The phenomenon of global dimming uh, is a very credible one. Uh, and the fact that the pollutants that we have generated have been essentially shielding much of the incoming radiation and therefore um, acting to slow down the rate at which the Earth is warming is in fact well known. What the show focused on is the fact that now that we are in many uh, areas cleaning up that pollution for very good health reasons and other reasons, uh, it's quite likely that in cleaning it up, we're going to be enabling the expression of even more rapid climate change. That indeed is a very valid concern. Um, Dr. Hansen is uh, an extremely competent, reputable scientist. Uh, he's long been at the forefront of climate change research in the United States. And uh, he is pointing to this, one of the things that I was emphasizing in my remarks, and that is the urgency of moving quickly in reducing emissions and preparing for changes. Many of the global change models that we have and many of the ways people talk about change is with the expectation that it's going to be gradual, that things change gradually. We know that in the past, climate has flipped. It's changed very, very rapidly. Nothing quite like what you see in the movie, uh, the day, what was it? The day after tomorrow, thank you. That's, that's definitely science fiction. But there are very rapid climate changes that we know of in the past. And the concern is that if the ocean conveyor belt, for example, slows down even more and changes very dramatically, <clears throat> we could be in for some very abrupt changes and some real surprises. 
We don't know how to model those. We don't know how to predict when they were ha will happen. We don't know where those tipping points are. But there is very real concern that abrupt climate change might bring some very uh, unwanted surprises. So there's urgency in acting sooner rather than later. Chuck Wilson, I appreciate your forceful message this noon. It brings to mind the predicament described by Jared Diamond in his book Collapse that the City Club has read recently. When would you predict if the global action that you've described were to take place, when would you predict we could begin to see a reversal of global warming? It, that's not an easy uh, prediction to make because uh, there are uh, so many uncertainties, not so much in there are uncertainties in how the climate system works, but there are even greater uncertainties in how uh, governments and individuals will or are responding. And so making predictions about any future climate uh, has a wide range of options. The Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the IPCC, which is the international scientific body that studies climate change and makes predictions about it, has made a range of predictions about future climate changes and options that might happen if we did this versus this. And all of those changes have wide ranges because there are inevitable uncertainties. So one can generate scenarios, but making precise predictions is really not feasible at this point. I'm Ray Polanyi, a City Club member. Uh, since transportation is one of the major contributors to global warming, uh, both in the fuel consumption but also in the kind of settlement pattern that it fosters, uh, what would you think uh, would be necessary to uh, provide more and better alternatives uh, in, in public transportation? both in the cities and in between the cities and so on. Do you have any recommendations? Angus, do you uh, want to help me out with that? I'd like to invite Angus Duncan to this mic. Angus was on the governor's advisory group on global warming with me and has studied many of these issues in great technical detail. Thanks, Shane. And, and, uh, I, I know where Ray's coming from and he's, I know where he's headed and he's headed in the right direction pretty much the same direction that, uh, that the uh, advisory group headed to. And I think the best answer that I can give is, is, uh, uh, is a reference to a New Yorker article that I read um, sometime in the last six months that observed that if the city of New York were the 51st state in the United States, it would be the most energy and carbon efficient state in the country not because there's something special about New Yorkers, them to the contrary, but because those kinds of urban densities uh, almost oblige people to save money and to reduce carbon emissions. It's way easier to take a subway or a bus in New York than it is to get in your car and drive. And, uh, and so aside from a lot of the public policy references that I think we all collectively agreed on, um, the, there is a special responsibility for urban areas to figure out how to reorganize them, themselves so they are even more energy and therefore carbon efficient than they already are. And I think the city of Portland you know, proved that a, a good part of its success in holding its emissions down to 1990 levels was in transportation. It was light rail, it was buses, it was bicycles, uh, and increasingly it is housing densities within the city. Hi, my name is Gavin White. I'm a City Club member. I'm also the chair of the Multnomah County Democrats. Thank you so much for being here today and speaking about these important issues. It seems to me that we need not only to take action as individuals, um, as you say, but take action as a state. And you describe some ways in which it's important for the state to support individuals, but it seems like we also need to take action to protect um, people from sea level rise, drought, and extreme weather events. I wonder if you could identify key actions that could be taken to prevent those sorts of risks um, if, if you've 
put the time into thinking about what we can do about that. And also, um, can you address to the extent to which you think the new Apollo project, for example, or other bold action might be useful in addition to helping individuals? Um, do you think that, like new Apollo project would be useful in preventing further climate change? Can you tell me what the new Apollo project is? Um, it's establishing centers of regional excellence around the state to develop alternative fuel sources and establish um, alternative energy production around the state. It, it, it goes into more depth than that. It, you know, there's a bonding authority that's granted on a funds that have already been set aside, and I could talk more about details another time. Uh, I don't know any of the details of that, so I can't comment on it. Um, and I really appreciate your drawing attention to very specific issues because that's indeed where the action is. Uh, and we do need to get down to specific um, things that we can do. Uh, and the state has a very important role to play in that. Um, the Governor's Advisory Group identified a number of areas in the categories that you flag that need additional study and more specific recommendations than we were able to do. Uh, and so um, beyond that, I'm not really able to provide any greater degree of specificity. Angus, do you have, do you want to add to that? Apologies. We had various people on the advisor group that had different kinds of uh, knowledge, and uh, Angus has a lot of the technical know-how. Sure, Jane. Again, just very quickly, um, the, the advisory group deliberately focused on mitigation measures, how to stop you know, producing more greenhouse gases from this state. And, uh, and certainly the Apollo project, um, which, which is focused particularly on renewable energy, um, is one of one of those mitigation measures or one a contributor to those mitigation measures um, there there is a governor's work group on renewable energy which is looking at a renewable portfolio standard something that would uh, uh, require utilities to increasingly rely on renewable energy um, as a as a resource to meet load uh, and the Apollo project was aimed at that as well what we didn't do is we didn't spend much of any time on adaptation measures. I think we collectively decided that, um, that if we couldn't make a case that we could mitigate emissions, reduce emissions, then um, adaptation was, um, there was something sort of futile about it. Uh, but if in fact we could make a case that the state of Oregon and other states could actually reduce greenhouse gas emissions, there still was a huge adaptation set of tasks. And frankly, we punted it to the next um, iteration of a governor's advisory group, which I understand Governor Kulingowski is going to announce here very shortly. Um, and then there are also just a series of, of ongoing measures, including um, adopting a carbon cap for utilities in the state. Uh, that would systematically set and then over time reduce the amount of carbon that could be emitted uh, by the utilities that are serving us our electricity and our gas. So the whole range of measures, I'd really encourage you to go to the Oregon Department of Energy website, um, download the report, you know, which got the supreme compliment, I think, for a government report. Someone said, this is pretty readable for a government report, and it is. Uh I would like to draw your attention to one of the uh, papers that's in the back of the room. Uh, there is a list, and actually there are a few on each table, that's called General Information About Climate Change and Global Warming. And the Department of Energy's website is on there, as, and that's where you can get a copy of the Governor's Advisory Group on Global Warming Report, as well as a list of other recent books and reports that might be of relevance to you. Uh, I put the list together because these are websites or references that are scientifically credible uh, and therefore ones that I would feel comfortable recommending to someone. One more? Sure. Guinevere Milius, City Club member. Um, after Hurricane Katrina, we saw a lot of damage to oil companies' property in the Gulf. And um, at the same time, I was reading reports that um, 
oil companies have been taking tours of the Arctic regions and uh, it's been pointed out that melting off of ice in these areas actually makes it easier for them to explore for natural gas and oil in the Arctic. Um, and I see, these, I, I see these two trends happening where, you know, their property is as much risk as anyone else's on a coastline, but maybe global warming helps them out. Do you think that there's enough um, momentum towards cleaning up our emissions that the oil companies are also doing something about it, or do they see a benefit here? The fossil fuel companies, oil and gas, are not monolithic. They uh, are a range of different kinds of uh, organizations. Some of them, uh, like British Petroleum, um, are in fact taking climate change very seriously and are actively working to reduce their own greenhouse gas emissions, figure out how to play in the cap and trade game that's now uh, been um, instigated because of Kyoto. Uh, and they have announced that they are reinventing themselves. They are no longer a fossil fuel company, but an energy company, and they are developing uh, renewable and green technologies. That said, they are one of the companies that is very aggressively moving to explore in the Arctic, as are many others. Um, I do think that it's critically important that we think long-term and wean ourselves of fossil fuels. We need to figure out both short and long-term strategies uh, for using uh, renewable uh, energy, uh, various green technologies to reduce emissions, and it has to be part of a package. Uh, it's interesting that in Europe, uh, Carla began the questions by asking about differences among countries. In Europe, the energy companies uh, tend to be much greener than they are in the United States. And I think that's something that uh, is really has acted against us in this country. And we really need to uh, have national policy changes that are much more in line with where the science is and much more in tune with what's in the best interests of all Americans. I'm afraid, I'm afraid that's all the time we have. I want to thank our speaker, Dr. Jane Lipchenko. Thank you, Angus, for your participation. And we're adjourned. Mm -hmm.